thank you for that warm introduction uh, i hope my slides are visible yes your slides are visible and voice is also clear yeah thank you so i think uh, continuing with uh, what my fellow colleagues have been talking about it, it everything revolves around obesity one thing which uh, you will find very common in all all the i would say at least today's topics is obesity so pcos again uh, is uh, something revolving around obesity and insulin resistance so uh, whenever we talk about pcos uh, generally uh, we talk about for infertility we talk about young females so but today i am going to talk about three clinical cases so pcos is uh, we have to look at across the lifespan uh, some uh, quick facts about pcos uh, you will see pcod was first recognized in 1935 About four in ten women uh, have PCOS are overweight most of the time. It is five out of the ten, so we can have females uh, without obesity also having PCOS, and most of the time, yes, uh, we see this in young females. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, survey, the nationwide PCOS survey. Uh, you will see the data. It says one in fifteen PCOS affects uh, the woman worldwide. approximately 50% of women with pcos suffer from obesity some important facts which i would like to highlight 25% of indian women did not know about pcos 65% of women are not aware of pcos symptoms and 35% of the women have never spoken about pcos forget about the males you will see uh, 60% of the men do not know what pcos so if if the female is suffering from it and she does not know the symptoms then i do not Uh, feel that yes, uh, probably males also will not be knowing much about it. So it affects one in ten women. You will see a uh, ten to fifteen percent women estimated to have PCOS. Fifty percent of the women uh, of PCOS going undiagnosed. So this is again a very important parameter. We keep on talking about diabetes uh, being undiagnosed, but you will see the rate is also very high with PCOS uh, as well. 50% of women with PCOS will develop type 2 diabetes pre diabetes before the age of 40 prone for developing GDM which my fellow colleague Dr Anita is going to speak about 13.8 billion estimated annual cost to the american healthcare i we do not have much data about the indian ones three time increase risk of women with PCOS developing endometrial cancer everything uh, with hirsutism is not pcos i think uh, most of us uh, whenever uh, we see either a hirsutism or we see an acanthosis nigricans most of the time yes the first diagnosis which comes is insulin resistance and by default we all are probably more attracted towards the pcod so here uh, let me get out the differential diagnosis for hirsutism and annulation yes pcos stands first it could be a ovarian tumor it could be iatrogenic androgen administration it could be obesity simple obesity induced hyperandrogenic annulation it could be a congenital adrenal hyperplasia and other i would say forgotten syndromes which we always have to consider as the cushings and prolactinoma so coming to my case one this is a 23 year old woman with a anabolic appearance bmi she is ob obese she is having hirsutism there is no clitoromegaly she is having grade 2 acne she is having a uh, uh, labs which are mildly elevated you will see the testosterone is on the higher side the dha is on the higher side a1c is uh, still much better so she is not uh, yet prone for i would say into that diabetic range uh before uh, jumping on to the management and diagnosis uh, let me get out a point what are the other causes of hirsutism so there are drugs commonly we use few of them so it is uh, important that we know about it androgens alone or with estrogens anabolic steroids clinically i would say uh, we all know minoxidil phenytoin so if you have a patient with epilepsy do not forget phenytoin or disoxide or cyclosporine so how how do you diagnose pcos i think um now most of us use the rotterdam criteria which says the patient should have two out of the three one is either oligomenorrhea 
second is hyperandrogenism so that could be either clinically or biochemical so a patient could present to you clinically the third would be a polycystic ovary on us uh, there is the ultrasound you should have at least a uh, greater than 10 ml size and more than 20 follicles so this is also a very important parameter let me make this factor very clear uh, in a country like india you can still diagnose pcos without an ultrasound so if you will see two out of the three both are clinical things which you can diagnose coming to the prevalence of pcos in india it is around 8 to 9% prevalence in uh, these small studies uh, which we have what do you do uh, when your patient has or that typical year age where it is around 20 to 25 they are uh, probably uh, are getting ready for their marriage in the future but not planning for pregnancy at that time so what do you do at that time how do you treat so hirsutism uh, at that time uh, can be used for removing the hairs uh, they have a different uh, many procedures like electrolysis plucking waxing shaving treating the underlying cause i think this is very very important. important where we come under play as physicians that we need to treat the underlying cause so it could be a ocps spironolactone finasteride flutamide metformin and then i would say most important weight loss what are the treatment options so when uh, the pregnancy is not desired so first thing is you regularize the menses you start ocps with uh, constantly less androgenic progesterone or cyclic progesterone because Uh, you need that endometrial shedding and it that increases the shbg treat the hirsutism uh, with spironolactone again uh, just concentrate uh, probably on the dose you can go as high as 50 to 100 mg per day diet and lifestyle will be a most important factor i would not go deep into that and insulin sensitizers i think uh, most of the data of uh, what we have is on metformin Uh, because it has now clinically shown as the benefits and now we have some emerging data which is coming on decarnosetol and manosetol individually and together as well pathogenesis oh i if i had to sum it up into one line there is increased testosterone levels which is uh, happening and then there is insulin resistance which is very high which is leading to all the clinical parameters So coming back to the case uh, you have to take the history do the labs do an ultrasound when it comes to management uh, you suppress the androgens ensure that uh, there is an endometrial shedding and optimize the diet and lifestyle coming to the medications oral contraceptives with less androgens progesterone spironolactone for hirsutism and insulin insulin sensitizers metformin would be the ideal drug followed by i think now most of us have that experience on imisetol i think that would come as a question on which we can discuss it later coming to the next spectrum that is the case 2 which is a known patient so here we have a 20 year 8 year old woman with pcos already a known case now if they come to you about discussing about their planned pregnancy history of menarche at the age of 10 uh, pcos diagnosed at 18 years intermittently on oral contraceptives and spironolactone started metformin 6 months back has a gradual increase in the weight which you can see pp is 130 80 obese with acanthosis grade 2 acne and no fertilization urine pregnancy test is negative so this is one patient in the spectrum which we all get which are already diagnosed and they come to you or they come to our gynec colleagues most of the time to discuss about the planned pregnancy which of the following treatments in the woman with pcos would be more effective in induction of ovulation to achieve a live birth or uh, we have uh, many of the drugs letrozole clomifenstrate uh, human menopausal gonadotropin cabergolin studies have shown that you will see that uh, when you give metformin yes metformin improves the insulin resistance lipids sometimes weight but clomiphene we all know induces ovulation but when you give it together so you will see across the bmi in the lower slide slide graph or and the above one when together they are giving a uh, metformin and clomiphene citrate together are given the chances of having uh, ovulation and pregnancy is much higher 
but a letrozole is better than clomiphene so here you will see this was a study which was published in the NEGM 750 patients uh, were started on uh, their letrozole 2.5 mg versus clomiphene citrate 50 mg day 3 to day 8 for 5 months definition was uh, anovulation hyperandrogenism or pcos ovaries live births you will see uh, which was higher 27.5 versus 19% uh, with cc that is clomiphene congenital abnormalities were uh, four versus one ovulation rate so again which was high with uh, low you will see letrozole versus clomiphene and pregnancy loss was 32% versus 29% the side effects or the adverse events you will see fatigue and dizziness uh, with letrozole versus hot flashes with clomiphene here again a uh, interesting fact which comes out is again if you see across the uh, the live birth rates across the spectrum of bmi varying from less than 30 to 30 to 39 and more than 39 you will see a letrozole phase much better when you compare it with clomiphene what should we do in patients like this should be recommend diet weight loss and zinc synthesizers yes uh, we need to give them all of them i would not again discuss it's already been discussed what about the future risk so uh, this is again very important uh, you monitor the weight every 6 to 12 months assess the individual cvd risk factors lipids and blood pressure because they are more prone for developing metabolic syndrome uh going to my third case very quickly so this is a 33 year old woman with pcos that the last spectrum i would say persistent with irregular menses have finished her uh, i would say family planning g2 p2 with need for induction of ovulation stable hirsutism on metformin and ocps wants to know what are the long term complications so it is not just uh, we are dealing with infertilities there are increased risk of these patients developing or uh, the other comorbidities as well so um, you will see the endometrial cancer risk is more these patients are prone for developing uh, metabolic syndrome have increased cardiovascular risk and you will see the risk of obstructive sleep apnea steatosis and now few studies also suggest there's increased risk of depression as well here you will see the obese pcos patients compared to the uh, non pcos obese there is increased risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea pcos and nafld meta analysis again you will see they are increased risk of developing nafld coming back to the case a screen woman with pcos at that age probably who have finished pregnancy for cardiometabolic risk and do not leave them there and treat to the guidelines reduce the blood pressure cholesterol and monitor for any blood sugars optimize the diet and lifestyle ensure endometrial shedding with ocps or cyclic progesterone evaluate for obstructive sleep apnea and evaluate for fatty liver one thing uh, i would say is a very important would be the risk of developing diabetes and gdm which my fellow colleague dr nandita would be speaking now over to dr nandita thank you thank you dr faraz um, of course before i start i have to thank uh, the organizers of uh, psg dr ritul dr supratik and the entire team and congratulate you on uh, organizing such a lovely event thank you for inviting me um, i will just quickly share my slides um just to confirm my voice is audible and is my first slide visible yes, as well yes yes your voice is visible and slides are thank you so much thank you sir um so uh, yes uh, the, the topic that dr faraz has introduced so far is the initial part of our um, uh, title here as you can see which is the link between polycystic ovarian syndrome and gestational diabetes um and rightfully it's been uh, called the trap so pcos and gdm the trap as the title reads Uh, Dr. Uh, Faraz has uh, very nicely alluded to and discussed the importance of PCOS. He's also um, uh, very nicely discussed three case studies, which makes it a lot more um, uh, easier for us to relate to. Um, the, my job over the next fifteen minutes or so is to carry this over and carry the link between PCOS and gestational diabetes. 
Um, when I was looking at prevalence data, uh, this is something that I found, which is a recent publication just a couple of months ago in the uh, Times of India, uh, prevalence that has actually um, indicated that the prevalence of gestational diabetes is in fact increasing in our part of the world, in India. And what is worrisome is that it's increasing not just in the urban India, but also in the semi-urban and rural India, as the um, newspaper cutting here in front of us shows. And of course, we also know that many of these patients do develop type 2 diabetes later on, um, uh, post uh, uh, partum in the, in the future years. And um, uh, the, the sad part is many of these women do not screen and hence end up with complications um, until they present uh, to the uh, doctor. Now, we all know, I think I'm going to probably just uh, skim through the slide. We know that there's two types. There's pre-gestational diabetes where the patient has pre-existing uh, dysglycemia, whether it's type 1 or type 2, and then gestational, which is dysglycemia diagnosed for the first time during pregnancy. There is a common soil that exists between PCOS and gestational diabetes, and that is what this flow chart very nicely depicts, which, which we have in front of us here. Um, insulin resistance is the major pathophysiological feature, which is common between the two. Uh, we have obesity, chronic inflammation, which leads to insulin resistance, in turn then leads to hyperinsulinemia. And all this together, of course, along with the hyperandrogenemia, we have manifestations in terms of hyperandrogenism, uh, in terms of polycystic uh, ovaries or anovulation in regular periods, which then leads to infertility and complications during pregnancy. And last but not the least, the development of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So it's all a sort of a continuum and we can't really tease one out from the other, uh, which is where the problem actually exists. Now, when we look at the risk factors for gestational diabetes, um, this is a publication in which they've actually done, done a statistical analysis to look at the independent variables in, in a regression analysis. And, the, and of course, as you can see, the, uh, the uh, significant factors is what is here in front of you. We know that, of course, overweight, obesity are major risk factors for, for development. We heard about that in the previous session. A previous history of gestational diabetes, a family history of type 2 diabetes, a history of macrosomia, uh, elderly primates or uh, pregnancy over the age of 25 or 35, multiple pregnancies, and last but not the least, what I've marked out over there in the, in the red box is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which stands out as a significant independent risk factor for the development of gestational type uh, diabetes. Um, this is our own publication. Now, what about the risk factors that increase this risk? We know that the um, risk factors that contribute to that increase in insulin resistance, the so-called common soil, which I just presented to you, uh, which increases the risk of gestational diabetes, increases the risk of polycystic ovarian syndrome, is increased waist circumference, increased obesity, dyslipidemia. Like I said, it's all one continuum. And here you have data that we recently published um, from our center in which we looked at a temporal change or whether there is in fact an increase in the um, risk factors among women between a time period of 10 years. So the last time that we had reported it was in 2006. We went back 10 years later in 2016 to look at whether there is in fact an increase. And we did find that there is a significant increase, which is quite worrisome. And this I'm presenting to you data among just women in both the urban and in the rural population. An in significant increase, as you can see the yellow asterisk, significant increase in waist circumference, significant increase in obesity, hypertension and dyslipidemia. And obesity rates are increasing both in the rural and in the urban women. So as I mentioned, it is a continuum. You have obesity and all these risk factors which contribute to polycystic ovaries, irregular periods, infertility, insulin resistance, which then presents with all the manifestations of hirsutism and as I mentioned, irregular periods, which then causes uh, problems during pregnancy, including gestational diabetes. Um, problems and complications, not just for the mother, but also for the fetus, which then in the mother can lead to chronic health conditions like type 2 diabetes in the future, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. So the whole thing is one continuum. As I mentioned, PCOS does increase the risk of subsequent gestational diabetes. And this is a publication that points that out, that there is an undeniable scientific fact uh, that both are definitely associated. 
And this is a meta-analysis to prove that we have various studies that have been included, which shows that there is in fact an increased risk of gestational diabetes in women with PCOS compared to those without PCOS. So why treat gestational diabetes? We know that, um, of course, this is a very basic slide, but just for us to uh, highlight the importance of it, we know that gestational diabetes does increase the risk of complications, again, in the mother and in the fetus. There can be macrosomia, neonatal hypoglycemia, uh, nerve injuries, preterm deliveries um, that increase um, uh, risk of offspring, offspring obesity and diabetes, which is questionable. There are some theories about that. The consequences of PCOS, of course, was discussed briefly by Dr. Uh, Faraz in his slides as well. But PCOS, the risk factors being obesity and lifestyle and genetic factors, which together can contribute to PCOS, can have metabolic, reproductive, and obstetric dis uh, disorders. So the reproductive disorders is infertility, menstrual irregularities, and endometrial abnormalities. Metabolic disorders would include diabetes type 2, gestational diabetes, and increased cardiovascular risk. Obstetric would be preeclampsia, premature birth, and gestational hypertension, and various others, which I'll be discussing briefly. This is data to show us that in women with or without PCOS, early pregnancy loss is also an issue. So these are the obstetric complications. As you can see, you have PCOS versus controls and the forest plot all pointing towards the right to show us that there is an increase in risk of early pregnancy loss among women with PCOS as compared to without. When women are further stratified according to their body mass index, the higher the BMI, the higher the risk of infertility, and this is in women with PCOS, of course, we find that there is a higher risk with, with an increase in body weight and increased PMI. You have an increased risk of infertility and an increased significant increase in the risk of EPL, which is early pregnancy loss, which is what data in front of us shows. Insulin resistance itself can be an independent risk factor for fetal macrosomia and early miscarriage. And here you have in this particular study where they have actually grouped women according to their HOMA IR or an increasing stratified them in increasing insulin resistance and they found that significantly higher insulin resistance can increase the risk of not just polycystic ovarian syndrome but also increase miscarriage risk and fetal macrosomia. So PCOS, yes, does increase the risk of complications in the pregnancy outcome. It can increase the risk of preeclampsia, preterm labor, shoulder dystocia, and all these are significantly increased. Also poly, um, polyhydramnios and uh, PIH. In the fetus also, there is a risk of macrosomia. There is a risk of neonatal uh, distress, respiratory distress syndrome, and neonatal hypoglycemia, which all are increased in women with PCOS and gestational diabetes as compared to those without PCOS. So what do we do about this? And this is one of my uh, final slides. And um, this is sort of to summarize what we've discussed so far, both Dr. Faraz and me, because this is what is the take home message that we are tomorrow going to take to our clinics. When we have patients with PCOS and the association of PCOS with not just gestational, gestational diabetes, but also during pregnancy, is you have you can divide it into three phases, which is the pre-pregnancy phase, the pregnancy phase, and the postpartum phase. So in the pre-pregnancy phase, we know that PCOS, the risk that we have is overweight or obesity. And for such a condition, we'll have to consider weight loss as an option, intensive lifestyle modification, and maybe you could even consider use of some weight loss drugs. And we also have drugs like the GLP-1 analogs, which are available if you have a presence of dysglycemia as well. Pre-pregnancy, PCOS is also associated with type 2 diabetes or um, dysglycemia, as I mentioned. So screening patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome for hyperglycemia or type 2 diabetes is also extremely important also screening them for systemic hypertension and to optimize the blood pressure in the pre-pregnancy phase is also crucial. During the pregnancy phase, the overall health of a person with PCOS is important to pay attention to, to pay attention to the comorbidities that the patient may already have, weight gain during pregnancy, which was also discussed uh, in the previous session by uh, the previous speakers, gestational diabetes, of course, screen for gestational diabetes 
in the first trimester if negative again screened at 24 to 28 weeks screen for hypertensive disorders because pcos is also associated like i mentioned earlier with pih and preeclampsia preterm delivery is also something to pay attention to and that's more of the obstetric uh, from the gynecologist point of view during the postpartum phase also we do need to monitor patients we Patient education goes a long way, and that's something that uh, we need to stress on, right? During the pregnancy, we need to, in fact, it's also discussed that even at the first visit of the uh, pregnancy, uh, when the patient presents with gestational diabetes, we must sensitize the mother about the fact that her risk of type 2 diabetes post-pregnancy or to continue to be diabetic, even if she uh, turns out to be non-diabetic postpartum, she may have that risk of type 2 diabetes in the future is something that we do need to sensitize them all through the pregnancy and keep reminding them about. Because many women do tend to neglect uh, and forget about it. And then, like, like I mentioned earlier, do present with complications only later on in their uh, life. So uh, post-pregnancy or postpartum, uh, post-delivery, we need to uh, focus on weight reduction. Look for dysglycemia or type 2 diabetes, persistent hypertension. And of course, uh, address breastfeeding difficulties that patient may have. Last but not the least, postpartum depression is also something to be addressed. So in summary... PCOS and gestational diabetes do share a common soil. Obesity, insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, hyperandrogenism, all this together contributes to increased risk of complications, not just in the mother, but also in the fetus. PCOS itself is an independent risk factor for gestational diabetes, other than the all, all the other risk factors, which include obesity, a positive family history for type 2 diabetes, previous history of gestational diabetes, elderly uh, mothers, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, PCOS can worsen outcomes of pregnancy when, uh, and with an increased risk of gestational diabetes. Early pregnancy loss, placental abnormalities, preterm deliveries, macrosomia are some of the risks. An appropriate intervention and timely intervention in the pre, during the pregnancy and the post-pregnancy or the postpartum period can help alleviate this risk and address um, to reduce the uh, risk of complications and improve outcomes in these patients. Thank you.